that we are only two months away uh, from the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery. Please join us on Washington, D.C. Grace, are you okay? Yeah, wait, waiting for you. Well, good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. We have two sessions for you for our summer introduction for the Congenital Heart Academy. And for both of these sessions, I'm going to be joined by Diane, who is going to be showing you specimens and we're going to be discussing again ventricular septal defects now why should we come back again to ventricular septal defects it's because as you know they are the commonest congenital malformations they can exist in isolation and today for the first part of our presentations we're going to discuss the morphogenesis of isolated ventricular septal defects. But you all also know well that we can have hearts with deficient ventricular septation in various combinations. And then what we'd like to do in the second of our presentations is to show you how we can use the same approach so as to account for all the instances in which you see deficient ventricular septation. So to start today, let's talk about morphogenesis. In other words, let's talk about the development of the heart and let's see how that relates to the situation in which the ventricular septum is deficient. So today we're going to talk about the morphogenesis of deficient ventricular septation. And what I'd like to discuss with you is, first of all, how many parts do we have in the normal ventricular septum? I'd then like to discuss with you some controversial issues. Is there a septum of the atrioventricular canal? Some people still define and describe ventricular septal defects on the basis of atrioventricular canal defects. So we need to look at whether there is indeed a septum of the atrioventricular canal. I particularly like to concentrate on the outlet septum. Is there an outlet septum in the normal heart? Or can we find an outlet septum when the ventricular septum itself is deficient? And then today, I'd like to relate these various features to hearts with deficient ventricular septation. And that's what Diane is going to do because she's going to join me and she's going to show you the hearts themselves. But I'm going to discuss with you the development. I'm going to start by reminding you that it is formation of the apical components of the two ventricles that sets the scene for formation of the ventricular septum. And it is the formation of the apical components that we understand on the basis of so-called ballooning. So I've shared this with you before, but let's get back to the start of human development. So you will remember I'm showing you these reconstructions that were made by my colleagues from the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. Professor Wout Lama's Dr. Jill Hickspurs. So here is a frontal reconstruction of a heart at the beginning of the fifth week of development. And you'll remember that CS stands for Carnegie Stage. So here we are, Carnegie Stage 11. In blue there, you see the systemic venous tributaries. They're coming together through the sinus horns. And this is the first stage 
at we, which we can see the developing atrial component of the heart. And it joins through the atrioventricular canal with the ventricular loop. And there at the other end of the ventricular loop, we have the formation, the outflow tract. So at this stage, we have a primary heart tube. The thing that sets the scene for formation of the apical septum is ballooning. And we can see that two stages later, we're in the middle now of the fifth week of gestation, 32 weeks. And again, I'm showing you a reconstruction made by Wout and Jill. And there again, you see the atrioventricular canal and it's opening to that inlet component of the ventricular loop, but ballooning from the outer curvature of the ventricular loop, specifically from its inlet component, we have the apical component of what will be the left ventricle. And there, ballooning from the outlet component, we have what will become right ventricle, and the right ventricle is supporting the outflow tract. So this is what it looks like in a reconstruction. Again, remember, we're in the middle of the fifth week of development. But I can show it to you now in an episcopic data set. And this is one of the data sets prepared by my other colleague, Dr. Tim Mohan. You've seen this before. Tim was working at the Crick Institute, like myself. He is now allegedly retired. But this is an image from one of his exquisite episcopic data sets. And we're looking at the short axis of the ventricular loop, and we can see it supporting the outflow tract. So you're looking here at the undersurface of the atrioventricular canal. And there you see how it is supported by the developing left ventricle. You see the trabeculations of the developing left ventricle. There's been ongoing development from the stage I showed you just a moment ago. So the right ventricle is now better formed. It has its own ballooning apical trabeculations, but still it supports the entirety of the outflow tract. Now we can see the spaces we are going to be discussing, the interventricular communications. And this is the primary communication, because at this stage, all the blood coming into the developing left ventricle has to pass through this primary communication so as to reach the developing right ventricle, the outflow tract. But with the process of ballooning of those apical components, we can see that some of the trabeculations are coming together. They are forming the caudal part of this interventricular communication, and they will be the apical muscular septum. But let's move on. And let's move beyond the stages of ballooning. You've now seen how ballooning produces the apical components of both the ventricles. So as to get an inlet to the right ventricle, we have to have expansion of the atrioventricular canal. And then we see the first key point to one of the questions I want to answer. Because as the atrioventricular canal separates into the right and left sides, we also see muscularization of the vestibular spine and the mesenchymal cap. So let's look at these stages. So I've gone back a little bit now. I'm in the middle of the fifth week of gestation. And this is an old section that was prepared by Wout Lamas whilst he was still working in the University of Amsterdam. He did this work together with Andy Wessels, who now works in uh, Charleston in South Carolina and with Anton Moorman. And it's a so-called four-chamber section, but we see the primary interventricular communication. <coughs> and we can see at this stage that there is brown tissue surrounding it, and this has been demonstrated by its interaction with the antibody to the nodose ganglion of the chick heart. And that surrounds the primary interventricular foramen. And it was by following these tissues that interacted with nose ganglion, no dose ganglion that we were able to show in the early 1990s that there was indeed expansion of the atrioventricular canal. So I've moved here to the beginning of the sixth week of development, Carnegie stage 16. Still, you see the caudal component of that 
ring of tissue is on the crest of the apical muscular septum. But when you look at the top part, you see that it is expanded rightwards. And this tells us that it is expansion of the atrioventricular canal that provides the right atrium with its inlet, leaving behind the remainder of the interventricular communication that we can now call the secondary interventricular foramen. But if we look back now at the atrioventricular canal, and here I've moved on a couple of stages further, we're at the beginning of the seventh week of development. You're looking down on the heart from above now, another of the reconstructions made by Walt and Jill. And in yellow, you see the atrioventricular canal myocardium. And hopefully you can see that it has been separated by fusion of the atrioventricular cushions. But when we look down through the right side, we're looking directly into the right ventricle. But this is the sub the structure I want you on which I want you to concentrate, because this is the muscularized vestibular spine. And it is fused with the cushions themselves, and it is divided the atrioventricular canal into the right and left sides, giving us the separate atrioventricular valvar orifices. And this is what it looks like when you look at it in a histologic section. And now you will recognize, I hope, the four chamber section. We're at the beginning of the seventh week of development. And very nicely now, we, you see, we have an apical muscular septum. I'm going to tell you shortly how it is the trabeculations that come together to form this apical septum. But you can also see that the atrioventricular cushions are fused. And now you can see the muscularized vestibular spine. And it is this spine that has formed the septum of the atrioventricular canal. So there is a septum of the atrioventricular canal, but it is not a ventricular structure. It is an atrial structure. It is formed by muscularization, as I just showed you, of the vestibular spine, along with the mesenchymal cap that's carried on the leading edge of the primary septum, and it provides the antero-inferior buttress of the atrial septum. Indeed, it is the true second atrial septum. So now let's move on and let's look at the structure of the atrial septum. Diane is now going to join me and she is going to show you the features of atrial septation, showing how the so-called septum of the atrioventricular canal is in fact the second atrial septum. We're looking at a four-chamber view of the inferior aspect of a normal heart where we can see the right atrioventricular junction and the left atrioventricular junction. This is the muscular interventricular septum. Here's the terminal crest. And just superior to this is where the superior cable vein would have joined the roof of the right atrium. Just to the left of that, we see one of the pulmonary veins entering the roof of the left atrium. In between those two venous structures is an interatrial fold. This is what is referred to now as the septum secundum, when in reality it is an interatrial fold. And this is where the primary septum or the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa will overlap the fold to close the oval foramen. The primary atrial septum is the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa, and you can appreciate how thin it is on cut, on cut section. The primary atrial septum has on its leading edge a, mes a uh, mesenchymal cap, which will then fuse with a component that comes from the extracardiac mesenchyme, known as the vestibular spine. These structures will then fuse with the atrioventricular cushions and muscularize to form this second true component of the atrial septum. This, in reality, or I should say developmentally, is actually the septum secundum. This muscular buttress forms the septum of the atrioventricular canal and allows for us to have separate right and left atrial vestibules and separate right and left atrioventricular valves.
So it is known as the atrio or the septum of the atrioventricular canal, and it's actually in the atrial component of the heart. If we go a little bit closer, we can see the normal offset of the tricuspid and mitral valves. The tricuspid valve inserted lower on the muscular ventricular septum, and the mitral valve lifted away from the septum by this inferoseptal recess. The inferoseptal recess is in part supported by this septum of the atrioventricular canal or that muscular buttress. And here you can see the component of the membranous septum that separates the left ventricle from the right atrium and how closely related that is to the inferoseptal recess. So, now we know we can have a septum of the atrioventricular canal, but it's an atrial structure. Let's now return to the first question I posed. How many components are there in the muscular ventricular septum? Is there a separate inlet component to the septum? And in fact, there isn't. And that is because as the atrioventricular cushions fuse and separate the atrioventricular junction, they leave what we call the inferoseptal recess within the left ventricle. So let me show you that again in the self-same section I showed you just a moment ago. It's a four-chamber section from a car, an embryo at Carnegie stage 20, just at the beginning of the seventh week of development. And you will remember that last time I emphasized the muscularized vestibular spine. But look at the relationship between those fused atrioventricular cushions and the muscular ventricular septum. Because there is an extensive recess between what will become the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve and the ventricular septum. And if I were to take a pin now, and I passed it through the inlet part of the right ventricle, through that ventricular septum, it would pass into that inferoseptal recess. It would not enter the inlet of the left ventricle. It would enter the inferoseptal recess of the subaortic outlet. There is no inlet septum in the heart. So let's look at that again now in a heart itself and let's ask diane to show you the features of this lack of an inlet septum we're looking at a short axis apical view of a normal heart and where my probe is is along the inferior aspect or the diaphragmatic aspect here you can see the right ventricle with the tricuspid valve in its inlet and the left ventricle with the mitral valve in its inlet the right ventricular outflow tract and the subpulmonary infundibulum wrap around the left ventricular outflow tract or the aortic root, which is the centerpiece of the heart. Here you can see the inlet component of the right ventricle and a portion of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And if I place my probe across the muscular interventricular septum, the inlet of the right ventricle is directly opposed to the outlet of the left ventricle. If we look at a close-up view of the left ventricular outflow tract, there you can see the aortic valve, the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve, and here is the inferoseptal recess. And it is because of the inferoseptal recess within the left ventricle that the muscular septum separates the inlet of the right ventricle from the outlet of the left ventricle. In this area is where the inferoseptal recess is supported by the muscular buttress and where there is a component of fibrous continuity between the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. If we look at a similar type of section that is just dissected a little deeper in to the interventricular septum, you can see that the ventricular septum is composed of muscular and membranous components. Here is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve where it crosses the membranous septum so that here is the interventricular component and just where it crosses is the, or where my probe is, is the atrioventricular component of the membranous septum. This specimen shows us nicely 
how the inferoceptal recess separates the inlet of the right ventricle from the outlet component of the left ventricle. And here you can see how its base is closely related to the membranous septum, and in this area is where it's supported by the muscular buttress or the septum of the atrioventricular canal and where the tricuspid and mitral valve will be in fibrous continuity. So now we know there's no sept there is a septum of the atrioventricular canal, but it's an atrial structure. We know that the muscular ventricular septum does not have an inlet component, but does it have an outlet component? So now we need to look at how the left ventricle acquires its outlet. And I've shown you this before. I've shown you how the proximal outlet cushions fuse and they create a tunnel in the roof of the right ventricle. And that tunnel is the secondary interventricular foramen, which you saw just a moment ago, at its left ventricular end. So as these cushions fuse, they create an embryonic outlet septum. So to start, we do have, during development, an outlet septum. What I'm going to show you is that with closure of the communication between the aortic root and the right ventricle, that septum becomes the subpulmonary infundibulum. So what are the steps we are looking at? Now, I've shown you this several times before. It's a picture of a mouse embryo. And what you are looking at is the stage at which two proximal cushions have come together and they have formed this shelf in the roof of the right ventricle. There is the aortic root. Look at its relationship relative to the muscular ventricular septum. It is still positioned above the cavity of the right ventricle. Indeed, space beneath it at this stage is part of the cavity of the right ventricle. But the formation of that shelf has produced a tunnel that has the secondary interventricular foramen at its left end, providing the connection between the aortic root and the left ventricle. So all the embryo now has to do to commit the aortic root to the left ventricle is to close off the remainder of that shelf between the aortic root and the right ventricle. But if we take a section through the same heart a little bit more caudal, we see the aortic root positioned above the ventricular septum with the secondary interventricular foramen at its leftward end, producing the communication with the left ventricle. But now you see at this stage of development, there is still a small communication between the aortic root and the right ventricle. So I've called this the aorta right ventricular communication, but when the aorta becomes committed to the left ventricle, it is also an interventricular communication. And in fact, we can also call this the tertiary interventricular communication. And that space is closed by the tubercles of the atrioventricular cushions. And you see here in this section at the end of the seventh week of development, you're looking at the short axis, there are the leaflets of the mitral valve. There you see the ventricular septum. At the top, we see the pulmonary root. And between the pulmonary root and the subaortic outflow tract, we see the muscularizing outflow cushions. So here is that tunnel we looked at just a moment ago, but now it is the subaortic outflow tract because it now has the secondary interventricular foramen at its leftward end, but that right ventricular communication has been closed by the tubercles of the atrioventricular cushions. And that will become the membranous part of the septum. But let me take you back just a few moments prior to that closure and show you a suboblique section at almost the same stage of development. But at this stage, the aorto right ventricular communication remains patent. So now those fused outflow cushions are functioning as a septum. 
they are separating the subpulmonary from the subaortic outlet. As soon as they fuse with the crest of the septum and the tertiary foramen is closed by those tubercles of the atrioventricular cushions, however, they will no longer be a septum. And we can see that now in these beautiful new sections that I've just gained access to, in which myocardium has been stained in green. And again, it's an oblique subcostal cut through the developing heart. And there you can see that the aorta right ventricular communication has just closed. And now those muscularized cushions are separating subpulmonary outlet from the aortic root. But they are no longer septal, because as we trace that fetal stages, and now you see we've cut across the aortic root, we find that between those muscularized cushions, we have extra cavitary tissue. The cushions themselves are transforming, become the freestanding subpulmonary infundibular sleeve. So let's now look at these processes the turn what starts off as muscularized outflow cushions into freestanding subpulmonary infundibulum. We're looking at this heart in attitudinally appropriate fashion with the diaphragmatic surface along my probe. You'll note that the arterial trunks are normally related as they exit the ventricular mass. When we look inside of a morphologically right ventricle, there are a few important structures that we need to note one of which is this very broad or prominent trabeculation within the morphologically right ventricle called the septomarginal trabeculation. It has a cephalic arm which rises up to become part of the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum, and it has a caudal arm which extends to reach the inner heart curvature. The caudal limb gives rise to the medial papillary muscle which has tendinous cords to impart support a portion of the tricuspid valve. The subpulmonary muscular infundibulum is formed by muscularization of the proximal outflow cushions during development, and it lifts the pulmonary valve up off of the right ventricular mass. The proximal outflow cushions also allow for the supraventricular crest to insert normally between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation, which is a part of the apical trabecular component of the interventricular septum. So when the supraventricular crest inserts normally, there's no potential for an outlet septum in the normal heart. So it's important to remember that the muscular interventricular septum and the membranous septum are all that make up the ventricular septum in a normal heart. When we look at the pulmonary valve, you can see that I have breached this a bit because I have effectively removed the pulmonary valve from the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum. You'll also note that in the right ventricular outflow tract, there is a true ventriculoarterial junction where the muscle of the right ventricle joins the fibrocollagenous wall of the pulmonary trunk so that within each of these valvar sinuses, there's a crescent of muscle. So if I now remove that pulmonary valve from the subpulmonary infundibulum, you can see that we did not breach the right ventricular mass at all, and that the pulmonary valve is lifted up off of the ventricular mass by that subpulmonary muscular infundibular or muscular sleeve. You can see I can also pull it back and that there is a significant area between the muscular infundibulum and the aortic root. Here you can see the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery arising from the aortic root. And because the muscular infundibulum lifts the pulmonary valve up off of the right ventricle, this is what allows surgeons to perform the Ross procedure. When they do that procedure, they have to be extra careful about the septal perforators coming from the left coronary artery adjacent to that muscular sleeve. In the next video that we'll see, we'll show how that supraventricular crest inserted normally between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation
allows for no outlet septum in the normal heart. Here I have a special dissection of the arterial trunks as they leave the ventricular mass. So I've removed the front of the right ventricular free wall, a part of the pulmonary trunk, and the anterior aorta along with the right coronary aortic valvar sinus. So this is the right atrial wall with the transverse sinus between it and the ascending aorta. Here's the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and our subpulmonary muscular infundibulum that is lifting the pulmonary trunk up off of the right ventricular mass. Also, you can see how the a, uh, pulmonary valve lies in a more superior anterior and leftward position than does the aortic valve. This dissection shows us the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum lifting the pulmonary valve up off of the right ventricular mass and as it joins the inner heart curvature, extending around towards the membranous septum. This is the caudal arm of the septomarginal trabeculation, and this is the medial papillary muscle. And here is the cephalic arm rising up to become part of the subpulmonary infundibulum. The important point here is that there is a fiber fatty tissue plane that extends between the right and left ventricular outflow tracts so that there is no potential for an outlet septum in this region. Another important point to make is that the aortic valve is supported in part by fibrous tissue. There is the aortic to mitral valve fibrous continuity and in part by muscle so that I've removed the muscular support of the right coronary leaflet in this area and there is a portion of muscle supporting part of the left coronary leaflet. This is the interventricular component of the membranous septum and there is the atrioventricular component. So what I've shown you is that the normal ventricular septum has only muscular and membranous components. And that membranous part is derived from those tubercles of the atrioventricular cushions. So how does all of this now relate to set defects? To answer that, we need to look at how these components come together. How is it that those proximal cushions can become the subpulmonary infundibulum? Why is it that those tubercles of the atrioventricular cushions may not be able to close the tertiary interventricular communication? And how does the apical septum itself come together? And can that embryonic outlet septum exist as a discrete entity, perhaps, when the heart is congenitally malformed? So to do that, we're going to start looking at hearts that have septal defects. So let's start by looking at apical muscular septum. Now, it's still thought by many that the compact ventricular walls are formed by a process of compaction, of coalescence of pre-existing trabeculations. This is not, in fact, true, but it is the case that the apical septum itself comes together by coalescence of trabeculations. And I can show you that again by this beautiful new heart. I told you we've recently gained access to this through the Human Biology Development Resource at the University of Newcastle. And this is a section through the middle of the coalescing ventricular septum. And everything that you see in green is myocardium. We're at the beginning, we're at the end rather, of the seventh week of development, Carnegie stage 20. The ventricular septum itself is intact. And you can see that at the margins of the ventricular septum, the wall is compact. But in the middle part of that apical septum, the trabeculations are coming together, they are coalescing, and they will eventually form the compact apical part of the ventricular septum. But we also know by the experiments that Dr. Mohan did whilst he was still at the Crick Institute, that that coalescence does not always come together perfectly. So these are some mice hearts in which Dr. Mohan perturbed the furin enzyme. 
We're still not entirely sure why perturbation of the furin enzyme should have these effects. But I'm going to show you that in the series of mice in which Dr. Mohan perturbed the furin enzyme, we produced various types of ventriculate septal defect. So here is a mouse at the end of normal ventricular septation, and by this stage, the ventricular septum should have coalesced. But as you can see, there are lots of tracts through the ventricular septum in this particular heart. There is incomplete coalescence of the muscular septum. So when first formed, that septum is akin to a Swiss cheese. And if coalescence does not happen properly, then those channels can be like a sponge, and that is what we call the Swiss cheese defect. But coalescence can also be abnormal, so that discrete defects can exist anywhere within the ventricular septum. And again, now we're going to revert to the hearts themselves. So Diane now is going to show you an example first of a Swiss cheese defect, and then she's going to show you how you can also have discrete holes in other parts of the muscular ventricular septum. I'm starting with a specimen that has actually an unbalanced atrioventricular septal defect. So you can see the slit like left ventricle here and the dominant right ventricle here. And the reason I'm showing you this specimen is because it reminded me very much of the mouse uh, four chamber view that Professor Anderson showed you. And when I put some tension on the septum, you can see multiple defects across the muscular interventricular septum. And this reflects the inappropriate compaction of the muscle during development. So I thought this was just a nice four chamber cut to show you uh, a similar view to what the mouse heart showed in the PowerPoint. If we look at a heart that does have multiple apical ventricular septal defects, this specimen again has been windowed or, or the free wall of the right ventricle has been removed so the tricuspid valve is intact in the inlet and the pulmonary valve intact within the outlet of this right ventricle. And looking at the apex, there are multiple tiny ventricular septal defects. Actually, this one not so tiny, but multiple defects secondary to in inappropriate compaction of the muscular interventricular septum. And if I go down a little closer and tilt the specimen, you can see all of those defects within the apical component. Looking at the left side, which has also been windowed, those defects are not as easy to see, but they are crossed by all of these increased trabeculations, and there are multiple holes within the apical actually the mid to apical component of this muscular interventricular septum. Looking at this open right atrioventricular junction, we can see that there are multiple deficiencies or fenestrations within the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa. Here is the coronary sinus, and this is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. There is a ventricular septal defect that is occurring beneath the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve or in the inlet component of this right ventricle. If I lift up the septal leaflet, the borders of this defect are entirely muscular. So this is a muscular inlet ventricular septal defect. If we mark the apex of the triangle of Cox in this area, the membranous septum will remain intact when there is an inlet muscular ventricular septal defect so that the conduction tissue will remain in its normal location at the apex of the triangle of caulk. You can trace a line from the junction of the membranous and muscular ventricular septums to the medial papillary muscle where the right bundle branch will emerge and extend along the septum marginal trabeculation. Looking at the left side of the defect, the membranous septum, which is here, remains intact, and it lies beneath the interleaflet triangle between the right coronary aortic sinus and the non-coronary aortic sinus. So the membranous septum remains intact, and the conduction tissue will not be affected when this 
muscular ventricular septal defect is repaired because it will emerge in this area at the apex of the inferior septal recess where there is tricuspid to mitral valve fibrous continuity and then it will ramify in normal fashion over the left ventricular septal surface. Here we're looking at the right atrioventricular junction with the tricuspid valve guarding the inlet. It is mildly dysplastic. We can also see the interventricular septum and three muscular ventricular septal defects so that all of their borders are completely surrounded by muscle. When these defects occur, it is secondary to failure of the trabecular layer within the interventricular septum to coalesce so that these defects can occur anywhere over the muscular ventricular septum. Here from the left ventricular view, these ventricular septal defects all have completely muscular borders and it's important to describe their location so that all of these defects are mid-septal and completely surrounded by muscle. So those discrete muscular defects can exist anywhere within that apical component of the muscular septum. But we can also have muscular defects opening between the outlets. How can that happen? Because we've established that in the normal heart, there is no muscular outlet septum. And the reason we have muscular outlet defects is because that muscularizing subpulmonary infundibulum does not itself fuse with the apical part of the ventricular septum. So this is what should normally happen. And I've shown you this before. Remember, everything that you see in green is myocardium. And there you see that the aorto right ventricular communication has closed. But I showed you that from this stage forward, those muscular outflow cushions would become the freestanding infundibulum. If it does not close, then they can persist not as an infundibulum, but as a muscular outlet septum. So let's now look at that lesion. This is a muscular ventricular septal defect that extends into the outlet component of the right ventricle. And by that, I mean it extends between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. The septomarginal trabeculation is this prominent right ventricular septal structure or trabeculation with its cephalic arm rising up to become part of the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum. And in this case, the caudal arm reaches the inner heart curvature protecting the conduction axis with this posterior inferior muscular bar. If we mark the apex of the triangle of caulk, it will be just at the tip of my probe and the membranous septum will remain intact in this case because of this posterior inferior muscular bar so that the conduction axis will run between the membranous septum and the crest of the muscular ventricular septum with the right bundle branch emerging relative to the position of the medial papillary muscle and then extending along the septomarginal trabeculation. Looking at the left side of the defect, the muscular bar is easily seen between the aortic and tricuspid valve and there is the muscular bar along the posterior inferior border separating the mitral and tricuspid valves. So this is a muscular outlet defect with no fibrous continuity between the atrioventricular valves. The membranous septum will remain intact in this area where my probe is pressing so that the conduction axis will emerge in this area and extend along the crest of the ventricular septum to ramify over the left ventricular septal surface. So this is what we have now seen in terms of muscular defects. I am showing you that you can have holes anywhere within the apical part of the septum. She's shown you we have a different mechanism to produce the muscular outlet defect, and that is failure of fusion between those muscularized outflow cushions and the apical part of the ventricular septum with that muscular posterior inferior rim formed by coalescence between the trabeculations themselves and the inner 
hard curvature. But to get a muscular outlet defect, those that developing proximal cushions that would become the outlet septum themselves have to be hypoplastic. That is probably why they are unable to fuse with the apical septum. But it's also possible that they don't muscularize at all. And that gives us a defect in which the roof is not muscular, but is fibrous still with a muscular posterior inferior rim. And again, we know that can happen because we have found this prototype in the colony of mice in which Dr. Mohan perturbed furin enzyme. So this is that particular heart. You can see in the subcostal oblique cut, there is the forming aortic valve, and there is the forming pulmonary valve. And if things had gone properly, there would be muscularization of the proximal outflow cushions. But in fact, in this heart, those proximal cushions have fused, but they have failed to muscularize. They remain as a fibrous entity. And now look what's happening posterior inferiorly. Because the trabeculations of the right ventricle have come together, they formed a posterior inferior muscular rim, and that has fused with the inner heart curvature. And that has given us an outlet defect, which is juxta arterial. It is roofed by the fibrous continuity between the arterial valves. It has a muscular postero inferior rim. And now Diane will show you this lesion, which is the juxta arterial outlet defect with that muscular postero inferior rim. And this is what it looks like. There is the juxta arterial defect. Its roof is aortic to pulmonary fibrous continuity, but it has a muscular postero inferior rim. So let's see it in a heart. Looking at the outlet component of this markedly hypertrophied right ventricle, we see a ventricular septal defect that is a muscular outlet defect and is also doubly committed and juxta arterial. The defect extends between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation, qualifying it as an outlet defect with the cephalic limb here and the caudal limb reaching the inner heart curvature and forming that protective posterior inferior muscular bar relative to the conduction tissues. The defect is doubly committed and juxta arterial because we see one of the hallmarks of the defect with fibrous continuity between the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve at its roof. This defect forms secondary to hypoplasia of the proximal outflow cushions, allowing for poor formation of the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum and the pulmonary valve not being lifted up off of the right ventricular mass as we see in the normal heart. So this allows for the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve to remain at the same level, producing this fibrous continuity at the roof of the defect. The membranous septum will remain intact in this specimen where my probe is pointing, and we can anticipate the apex of the triangle of caulk is in this area. If we trace a line from the apex of the triangle of caulk to the medial papillary muscle, we see where the right bundle branch will emerge and extend along the septomarginal trabeculation so that this posterior inferior muscular bar is protective of the conduction tissues. When we look at the left side of the defect, here we see that posterior inferior muscular bar and the membranous septum will remain intact in this specimen at the base of the interleaflet triangle between the right and non coronary aortic valvar sinuses. The hallmark of the defect can be seen by lifting up the aortic valve to show us that fibrous continuity between the aortic valve and pulmonary valve in the roof of the defect. So the conduction tissues will emerge at the apex of the inferoceptal recess and extend between the membranous and the muscular ventricular septum with the left bundle branch emerging here. And as Professor Anderson says, with the eye of faith, you can even see some of the fascicles extending over the left ventricular septal surface. 
So now, I hope you'll agree, we've explained why you can have the different types of muscular defects, why we can have juxta arterial defects, juxta arterial defects with a muscular postro inferior rim. But you will all know that we've not accounted yet for the commonest form of ventricular septal defect. So to explain that, we have to ask the question, what happens if those cubicles, the atrioventricular cushions, are unable to close that communication that persists as the outro cushions themselves build the roof in the right ventricle, the communication between the aortic root and the right ventricle. And that aorta right ventricular communication is also potentially a tertiary inter ventricular communication. And if that does not close, then we have the perimembranous defect. And so back again to Dr. Mohan's Cohen, co Dr. Mohan's cohort of mice in which he perturbed furin enzyme. Because in some of those we found the prototype of the perimembranous defect. And this is a very interesting mouse. So we're looking here up into the roof of the right ventricle and see that there is the aortic root. Surrounding the aortic root, we have the subpulmonary infundibulum that is fused by muscularization of those proximal cushions. Postal inferiorly, we have the fused atrioventricular cushions. But the tubercles, of the atrioventricular cushions, have been unable to close that persisting communication between the aortic root and the right ventricle, that is also the tertiary interventricular communication. So this is what the heart looks like when we make a four-chamber section, a frontal section, through that defect. There it is, the aorta right ventricular communication. We can also consider it as the tertiary interventricular communication. And there is the mitral valve. There is the tricuspid valve. You can see the line of fusion between them. But the tubercles have been unable to close the tertiary interventricular communication. And that gives us the phenotypic feature of this heart, in which we see that despite the presence of a subaortic infundibulum, discontinuity between the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve, still we have fibrous continuity between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. And that is the phenotypic feature of the perimembranous defect. And so this is what we see in the perimembranous defect. There is the defect itself. It is that communication between the aortic root and the right ventricle. And its phenotypic feature is mitral to tricuspid continuity. And it is that feature that tells us the atrioventricular conduction axis will be postero inferiorly. So now Diane is going to show us the features of these perimembranous defects, which can open to different parts of the right ventricle, but retain a phenotypic feature, fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the tricuspid and the mitral valves. That perimembranous defect is the tertiary interventricular communication. It cannot be closed because the myocardial borders of the auto right ventricular communication are deficient. But as we will see, the defect could open centrally to the inlet, to the outlet, or if particularly large, it can be confluent. So now let's see those defects. This right ventricle has been opened in clamshell fashion so that we see the tricuspid valve in the inlet of the right ventricle and the pulmonary valve within the outlet. There is a central perimembranous ventricular septal defect. These defects are typically small and they occur beneath the zone of apposition between the septal and the anterior superior leaflet. One of the other important characteristics of this defect is that you have normal insertion of the supraventricular crest between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. So the body of the septomarginal trabeculation is here with the cephalic arm rising up to become part of the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum and the caudal arm 
remaining intact and reaching the inner heart curvature. So again, the supraventricular crest, you can see nicely here, is normally inserted between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. Arising from the caudal arm is the medial papillary muscle, which is typically on the anterior superior aspect of these defects. If we look at that same uh, defect from the left side, here we can see that there is actually muscle extending between the tricuspid valve and the aortic valve, and there is a remnant of the membranous septum. This defect is perimembranous because there is fibrous continuity along the posterior inferior border between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. Here we're looking at another central perimembranous ventricular septal defect and its borders as seen from the morphologically right ventricle. Here we can see the supraventricular crest inserting normally between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation with its cephalic arm arising up to become part of the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum. And here we have the medial papillary muscle arising from the caudal arm which reaches the inner heart curvature. The defect lies beneath the zone of apposition between the septal and anterior superior leaflets of the tricuspid valve, and this defect extends into the inlet component of the right ventricle, so that it is beneath the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, and you'll be able to appreciate that the border along the posterior inferior aspect of the defect is much closer to the coronary sinus than was the previous smaller central perimembranous ventricular septal defects. So this defect extends into the inlet component of the right ventricle. Looking at the defect from the left side, here we see this extensive area of fibrous continuity between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve which is the hallmark of a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. In this heart also we have fibrous continuity between the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve. This is a perimembranous ventricular septal defect that extends into the outlet component of this right ventricle. And by that I mean it extends between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. The septomarginal trabeculation is this prominent septal structure within the right ventricle and the cephalic arm extends up to become part of the subpulmonary muscular infundibulum with the caudal arm deficient in this case and not reaching the inner heart curvature. And this is the area where we end up with the tricuspid to mitral valve fibrous continuity along the posterior inferior border. If we want to give the surgeon an idea of where the conduction tissue will be located, we need to mark the triangle of caulk, and if I pull on the coronary sinus, you can see the tendon of Tadaro becoming a prominent structure along with the hinge line of the tricuspid valve marking the apex of that triangle, which will be along that posterior inferior border of the defect, and by tracing a line from the apex of the triangle of caulk towards the medial papillary muscle, we can see where the right bundle branch will emerge and extend onto the septomarginal trabeculation. Looking at the left side of the defect, we know that the left bundle branch will emerge in the area where there is mitral to tricuspid fibrous continuity, and it will extend along the crest of the ventricular septum to ramify over the left ventricular surface of the septum. You can see the defect is perimembranous by this area of mitral to tricuspid fibrous continuity. In this case there is also aortic to tricuspid fibrous continuity. So there we are. What I hope we've shown you this afternoon is that, depending on the developmental perturbations, defects between the ventricles can be muscular, they can be juxtaarterial, or they can be perimembranous. Let's not forget that we can have additional complications over and above the mere presence of those holes 
and typically they reflect malalignment of septal structures. We can have atrioventricular septal malalignment, and that is what we see with straddling and overriding of the tricuspid valve. More frequently, we have malalignment of the outlet septum, which itself can be muscular or fibrous, and we see such malalignment typically in tetralogy of fallow or when it's malaligned posteriorly in the setting of interruption or severe co-optation. We don't have time to show you all of these details, but what I hope we have shown you this afternoon is how now knowledge of cardiac development permits us to offer you a rational explanation for the different types of so-called isolated ventricular septal defect. And in our Next session for our summer series for the Genital Heart Academy, we're going to show you how these concepts can be advanced so that we can account for all the hearts with deficient ventricular septation. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Beautiful presentation and beautiful images, Diane. Thank you very much. So let's start as usual with Dr. Silverman making his comments. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me today, uh, Bob. Uh, it's a great privilege to listen to you. And as a student of yours, to see the progression of knowledge. And I think the most important thing for the viewers here, because I try to look at myself as just one of the confused viewers who might be looking at your information for the first time. But uh, the, the issue is that uh, over the course of many years that we've been discussing these, there's been a sort of a change of thinking. And I think that it's important to appreciate that as the uh, knowledge in, uh, and the ability to recognize these things in the, the finite morphology of the Diane's spectacular specimens, are unbelievable and uh, and the embryology that we can understand that there have been certain changes. For example, I remember you cutting a heart and showing the heart as an inlet component, a trabecular component, and an outlet component. And of course, this worked very well for old-fashioned description of ventricular septal defects, but in fact, it is not true. And I think that you need to confirm this because uh, people have followed the, your uh, work for a long time and have seen uh, these things that are not really cast in stone, but that they really reflect what you see in a ongoing understanding of developmental uh, knowledge. Well, I think, Norman, you make some crucial points there because you're right that I mean, things have moved forward and our initial understanding, as you pointed out, was somewhat rudimentary. And it's as we get further in and we begin to look at the hearts and we begin to compare what we now know about development that we can uh, understand these things better. I think the point you made about Diane's dissections, I think today her uh, dissections fitted into my developmental considerations like a hand fits into a glove. And I think her initial really? demonstrations where she showed where we find the septum of the atrioventricular canal, where we find the membranous septum, and then her beautiful dissection showing how in the normal heart, you do not have an outlet septum. I think that fitted so superbly with what I had tried to show you from the developmental point of view. And you're right. We've had to change our concepts markedly with the new information we have at our fingertips. But I think that I, I, I think the point you made about Diane's demonstrations today were particularly important. We have moved on and we have done things bit by bit. And in my introduction, I pointed out that we were revisiting ventricular septal defects because the other point you made, it's not easy to get a handle on all this. And I think we need to take the time. Adrian Kruchan, who sadly can't be with us today, but he's going, he sent me various questions. 
which I hope have been answered by the demonstration, by Diane's dissections in particular. But he makes the point, and you've made the point also, we need to go back and we need to look at these presentations again. They are the, held on the, uh, on the website of the Congenital Heart Academy. I think for me, today's demonstration brought everything together far better than I could possibly have anticipated. I had not seen <laughs> Diane's dissections because I depended upon her to match what I had shown in the developmental part. And I think today she really outstripped herself because I think her, dem her demonstrations today were perfection. So Diane, thank you for that. And maybe yeah. you would like to say a word to Norman. Well, before she does that, I want to say something to her and to you, is that being an echocardiographer, I look at Diane's work as an echo of your uh, understanding. And I think that it's been, as you say, absolutely per perfect. And I can only say that I'm in awe of her ability, not only in the description of the anatomy, but in the understanding of the electrical conduction of the heart today. It was quite magnificent and certainly a lesson for any surgeon who's wanting to uh, repair these defects. Diane, come in. Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, I, I just think that all of the uh, new embryologic uh, data that, that you've been putting out over the last what, five to eight years or so has tremendously helped me uh, in just looking at the normal part and the congenitally malformed part and understanding where I have to dissect things to, to demonstrate what you show embryologically. So it, it's, it's been a lot of fun and a lot of uh, good learning experience for me, as far as even teaching uh, other people as well. I'm gonna have to come and visit you, Diane. I, I see that Diane also has Dr. Quinty Senza with us. Q, how are hey, Jim. you? Good, good to see you all. Uh, I've been uh, kind of uh, well, sparse to see you uh, the last, last several months. But but I would I would just completely agree with what you're saying. You know, we have the benefit of Diane here on campus and, and what she does and, and the the uh, the elegant dissections and the you know the clarity. Of, of seeing this anatomy is just just so tremendous, you know, for for all of us, our learners, the echo folks, sur surgical uh, folks. I mean, it's just been very very helpful. She's also transcending now into getting these things digitized with advanced imaging techniques. So not only do we have the specimens, but the ability to kind of have them in, in digital format so that they can be, you know, just transmitted to actually worldwide uh, is 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 also another tool that she's really uh, kind of starting to uh, advance more and more. So uh, lots of lots of progress that has been made and, and, and certainly more to be made. So uh, it's exciting. Well, I'm particularly gratified that you're giving her the opportunity, Q, to, uh, to do what she yeah, really yeah. is doing. And she does it so superbly well. And I think, as I say, today, I think she surpassed herself. Norman, you want to say something? Well, I, I just want, I don't want to uh, go too crazy about uh, this, but Diane is an incredible resource. And I think, uh, you know, uh, how lucky uh, the people at uh, the Johns Hopkins in uh, St. Petersburg are to have her on their faculty and what kind of a, uh, an advance she must make for those people in their understanding. Bob, I have a few more questions to ask you. The first relates to this furin enzyme, and I've seen this before. Can you tell me something, or the re reviewers, uh, the the, the uh, audience, something about the furin enzyme and what it does, and possibly how it works? I have no idea, Norman. <laughs> Doctor Mohan gave me this set of hearts in which he had perturbed the furin enzyme. I've asked Doctor Mohan what it does, and he's not entirely sure either. Okay. And, what he, and he gave me a, a, a series, I think there are about 14 mice in which he'd perturbed the enzyme. And as you have seen, some mm -hmm. had multiple muscular defects, two had juxtaarterial defects. The one I showed you had that beautiful perimembranous defects and others 
have double outlet right ventricle. Oh. And that's particularly pertinent to one of the questions we've had in the chat box. Because Jason Tan asks, should double outlet right ventricle with subaortic VSD be reclassified to the VSD spectrum? And it absolutely should. But the difference there, and this is what we are going to discuss in our next session, which will be at the end of July, we're going to show you how in double outlet right ventricle, the area that we should be concentrating on is the communication between the aortic root and the right ventricle, because that is the part that is the perimembrous defect. That is the part that Dr. Quintessenza will close in the operating room so as to put the aortic root back into the right ventricle. So absolutely double outlet ventric right ventricle is part of the spectrum, but the channel on which we need to close is not the left ventricular entrance to the aortic root, it is the right ventricular entrance, and that is the part we call the ventricular septal defect It when there is a perimembranous defect. We also have a question from Peck Kin Chan to everyone, can a patient have more than one type of VSD? And of course, you can have muscular defects coexisting with perimembranous defects. I don't think you can have, you could have a juxta arterial defect coexisting with an apical muscular defect. So yes, the defects can coexist. If we know the basic morphology, we can make sense of it all. We've also had a question from Miguel Angel Arizapana Arapa. Forgive me if I've not pronounced your name correctly. And he asks, should you also consider what the interventricular septum is in the same plane or has a bad alignment? And this is absolutely true. And the situation of malalignment, as I explained at the end, is an integral part of ventricular septal defects. But sadly, we did not have time to discuss that. But Norman, perhaps you can say something on malalignment for the echocardiographer. Well, I think it's very easy to see malalignment because uh, you get to see where the uh, muscular septum is in respect to the other septums, uh, or including the atrial septum. So when you're looking at a, 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 an, um, a, a, a tricuspid uh, straddle, for example, the septa are really quite di uh, divergent from each other. They don't line up one next to the other. And I think for the outlet defects, particularly the posterior defect that you see with the uh, uh, co-optations, even when they are not so severe and with interruptions, it's very easy to recognize because the septum is out of the line of, of a single plane that you would see it. So I don't see that as a problem uh, in terms of making that uh, uh, differential. And in fact, when we do our next session, uh, uh, Diane and I will concentrate much more on defects that have malalignment because we can think of double outlet, in fact, as the extreme form of malalignment where the outlet septum remains within the right ventricle. So in our next session, we'll show straddling of the tricuspid valve, as you have commented, Norman, we'll show tetralogy of fallow, and we will discuss the significance of malalignment. Dr. Arapa has asked another question, and Q, perhaps you can help us with this one. He says, how do you think the subpulmonary defect, here I think he's referring to the juxta arterial defect, should be repaired when there is already compromise of the aortic valve? Is it only mild or not to wait until valvar regurgitation is already generated? So Q, you can help us there. Yes, so, so the question, I think the, the repair for those usually incorporates the patch on the hinge point of the pulmonary leaflet. Um, and and I, I, I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm understanding, was there a question of the timing for yes, the- Yes, he's saying, should you, should you wait until valvar regurgitation becomes apparent before you operate or should you operate immediately you make the diagnosis? Yeah, I think usually we operate, um, you know, from, for signs of, of things like, you know, heart failure, failure to thrive, you know, in, in young babies um, and, and not thinking about waiting for, you know, a secondary 
you know, thing like insufficiency of the aortic valve to occur in very small defects, which are not physiologically, you know, causing heart failure. I mean, that question comes up. Um, but I think our bias is, is pretty much that this defect, uh, you know, usually is, is, is causing kind of a more of a significant problem and it gets repaired upon diagnosis as opposed to following these patients. And indeed, these days you'd have no problem in operating and correcting a juxta arterial defect in a an, an neonate. Correct. In fact, you know, interrupted aortic arch, as you know, has uh, these defects common, right? So uh, we see those in, in very tiny babies. Uh, and, and of course, that, that actually brings up another point where I was going to ask is that um, it, when, when we do the repair in, say, an interrupted aortic arch, and we know a percentage of those patients will come to have significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and will need a Ross operation down the road, we're, we're kind of in a, a difficult spot there where we've kind of altered the pulmonary valve, which is what's going to be our, our neo-aortic valve when that patient does need a Ross. And, uh, you know, when you see the anatomy so clearly, you can really understand, you know, how how we have to repair it. And then once we do repair it, you know, some of the challenges of being able to use that valve, which I'm not, I'm not sure we really can use that valve. And it's about a third of patients that would ultimately be challenged by that situation. Uh, Bob, if I can chime in for Miguel Arapa, I think uh, I would echo what Julian Hoffman once said. It's easier to fix a ventricular septal defect than it is to repair a, a herniated aortic valve cusp. And we found that once you have aortic insufficiency in this situation, you can improve it, but you never get rid of it. So the long-term effects of um, the doubly committed subarterial defect or juxta arterial defect are, are, are significant. And uh, the old uh, wives adage of a stitch in time saves nine is a very useful adage. Indeed. I think, uh, uh, Bob, I have three more questions. Well, uh, I think I want to answer. Before you move on to your questions, you slipped into. Uh, you'll have to put a, a dollar in the in the swear box because you said cusp instead of leaflet. Yes, I know. Okay, I'll put a dollar in. Um, uh, how about a pound, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but um, so you've done the thing on the furin enzyme. One of the things that I think is a little difficult because it's more in the verbal than it is in the visual. And that is this pro the problem of the tubicles of the valve. And I think that uh, when you're going to do this next week, next month, perhaps you can show the tubicles of the, um, the valve uh, or of the canal a little bit more clearly. Uh, if you have any uh, examples, and if Diane can see any of those on on any of her specimens, that would be uh, very, very useful. I don't think that Diane would see them, but I do have pictures of the mouse heart. They are really just the protuberances, like, uh, I mean, you, we talk about the tubercles of the vertebral bodies, and they're just little protuberances on the front edge of the cushions as they come together uh -huh. and they close the defect. So I only use the word because those are the terms that Odgers used a long Correct. time ago, 1938, when he first described mm -hmm. formation of the membranous septum. Yeah. But I will show you a picture of those next time, or at least if I remember. And, and I, I, looking at this again from the point of view of the audience, it's very difficult for me to appreciate that the left ventricle and the right ventricle are, are, uh, are not separated by um, by the muscular septum, and well, uh, well, Diane well, had pointed, they, are, they are. Well, Diane pointed out that the right ventricle is going to the posterior inferior recess, and that that is a little difficult to see. No, but it's the septum is between the the, the post infraseptal recess is merely an inferior extension of the subaortic outflow tract. And then the muscular septum is between that infraseptal recess and the right ventricle. The infraseptal okay, recess is part of the cavity of the left ventricle. Okay, but it's also between the right ventricle and the left ventricle proper, the body of the the the, the left the ventricle. apical part. But the, yes. but, that, okay. but I mean the whole muscular part of the septum really is is a complex area. But 
maybe Diane can show you that in a normal heart next time, although we're going to have a lot to show you next time. Well, I understand, but you know, there are questions that um, confuse me, and if they confuse me, they confuse a lot of other people too. Indeed. And the other thing is about the outlet septum, that there's no outlet septum in the normal heart, that it's lifted off, and this is a new concept, and I think very important to appreciate, and one of the things that I think show how constant revisiting of uh, data uh, produces uh, more insight into the deep diseases. If you had any doubt about that fact, I think Diane's second dissection that she showed you today, where she showed you the relationship between the infundibulum and the aortic root having removed the right coronary sinus, I think that is the clearest dissection I've seen yet to show yes. that there is no outlet septum in the normal heart. I agree with you. It's a difficult concept to get on board, but I think that you can revisit Diane's dissection because that was perfect. I think you can do a lot of revisiting of today's lecture. Indeed. With that, I sign off. Indeed. Well, thank you, Grace. And so uh, our, next, our final session for the summer will be, I, correct me if I'm wrong, July the 21st, is it not? Yes, correct. So on July 21st, we'll summarize everything, we'll put everything together, and then you'll all be ready to re-congregate in Washington for the World Congress. I will not be with you for the World Congress. Oh, dear. Oh, but Diane will, and Diane and Q, you're going to be there? Yes. And you're there. Diane, you're doing all manner of anatomical things, are you not? We are. There are four days of morphologic sessions, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And are we going to see any of Q's fancy new stuff with his new surgical lab or whatever it's called? Yes, we're planning on having a nice little presentation and during a dinner meeting, which you are invited to, but I'm sorry to hear you're not coming. I hope uh... I'll get an invitation, Q. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank oh. you, everybody. So, well, thank, thanks particularly to Diane, whose dissections were spectacular. Thank you, Grace, for hosting us all. And we look forward to seeing you all again on July the 21st. Bye-bye, guys. See you. Bye -bye. Thank you.